part of it. Um, I'm uh, Shoibal Chakravarti, I'm, the, I'm a visiting professor at the Devecha Center for Climate Change. And this panel uh, is being hosted by the Devecha Center for Climate Change. Today's panel is titled uh, India's Interim Climate Policy Preparing for Net Zero. Um, as we all know, in the Paris COP, we as a world agreed to avoid dangerous global warming and that uh, translates to trying to avoid going above 1.5 degrees of warming. Um, and the IPCC uh, global a special report on uh, global warming of 1.5 degrees uh, recommended that uh, that's equivalent to uh, lowering our emissions to zero by 2050 or approximately emitting at the most another 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide. So that's what this panel is about. What does this mean for India and the developing world? Um, how do India and other developing countries balance their development and climate challenges simultaneously? So this panel will uh, discuss the climate policies, climate institutions, and climate diplomacy initiatives that uh, India and the developing world would need to prepare for a global net zero target. Uh, let me introduce the uh, panelists briefly. Um, uh, Professor Tejal Kanakkar is at the Institute, National Institute of Advanced Studies, Bangalore. She will speak on uh, India's position on the global net zero target. Uh, Professor Navroz Dubash is at the Center for Policy Research, uh, New Delhi, and he will speak about uh, uh, climate policy architectures and institutions. Um, Professor Somanathan is at the Indian Statistical Institute, New Delhi. He's going to talk a bit about the glo global climate incentive. Uh, Professor Jay Srinivasan, uh, Emeritus Professor at Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore, and founding director of the Devecha Center is our moderator and discussant. Um, I will speak on India's near-term climate policies. Um, so let's start with uh, Professor uh, Tejal Kanatka. Thank you, Shabal. Uh, let me just share my screen. So, um, I mean, Shabal introduced the entire concept of uh, net zero and uh, what it means. There seem to be a flurry of declarations on net zero that are coming in as we head towards uh, COP26. We have, uh, uh, there is a lot of pressure building on multiple countries to declare net zero. What does this net zero target mean? I mean, it is going, uh, your, your net emissions should go to zero. That means that as much emissions, anthropogenic emissions as you emit, uh, there must be methods that you have uh, employed to actually absorb those emissions or reduce those many emissions from the atmosphere that is not net zero and five. So there seems to be a lot of focus here. And uh, net zero does find a mention, net zero emissions targets do find a mention in the Paris Agreement as well. But they are uh, uh, supposed to be, it's supposed to be a global net zero target. It is not meant to apply to individual countries that same form. Um, so what does it mean? And what did the IPCC report say? So the IPCC report doesn't actually say that you can either reach net zero by 2050 or limit emissions to 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide. What the IPCC report very clearly says is that while net zero is a condition, a, a precondition, a, a requirement, not a precondition, a requirement, uh, to limit temperature rise to any uh, limit. So you might want to limit temperature rise from pre-industrial levels to five degrees Celsius. And you would still have to go to net zero at some point of time. But the key determinant of this temperature rise is the amount of cumulative emissions implied by how you get from where you are today, where the world is today, to net zero. And so it is this global carbon budget that is really the determinant, the key determinant 
And so when the world reaches net zero, is it entirely flexible? As long as the cumulative emissions implied by that trajectory of reaching net zero uh, is limited within a specified carbon budget. And as uh, I mentioned, 500 gigatons of carbon dioxide, that is equivalent, that is, that is the remaining carbon budget, what is remaining from 2020 onwards, till the world reaches net zero, to limit temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees Celsius, with a 50% probability, as per the latest IPCC report. And so what I mean by this flexibility is this. Uh, so if you actually have a linear reduction, we are at about uh, close to 50 gigatons of carbon dioxide equivalent uh, without the other um, in 2019. If we start reducing the world as a whole, what I mean by we here is the world as a whole starts reducing emissions and goes rapidly to zero, net zero emissions by 2050, then there are certain, the area under this particular uh, curve is the total cumulative emission. And what we will end up emitting is about 730 gigatons of carbon dioxide. And give or take, some of this uh, might be absorbed by UCF uh, land use and land use change and forestry emissions. However, let's assume that we have 730 gigatons of carbon dioxide. This corresponds to about a two thirds probability of exceeding 1.5 degrees Celsius. Um, it will lead to a very good chance that we limit temperature rise to below 2 degrees Celsius. But even this, reaching net zero linearly uh, by 2050, will not give us a very good chance of limiting temperature rise to below 1.5 degrees. Alternatively, what we can do is this. This particular emission trajectory also has the same cumulative emissions. Here, what we are doing is reducing front-loading emissions reduction. So there's a rapid reduction in emissions initially, and which then tapers off with a long tail going to net zero by 2100, not 2050. The cumulative emissions implied by this particular trajectory is the same. It's 730 gigatons of carbon dioxide with the, with the same probabilities for 1.5 and 2 degrees Celsius. And so therefore, why I wanted to do, I mean, show this illustration is to say that this particular trajectory of rapid reductions initially uh, and then sort of tapering off is what we would prefer because that then leaves, that long tail leaves some flexibility for developing countries, for poorer countries who do not have the means to uh, you know, undertake high uh, levels of mitigation today or have a huge developmental deficit like India to be able to uh, use the resources that they can to then get to a particular point from where reductions become easier, cheaper, and uh, you know, more reasonably possible to undertake. Front loading of global emissions reductions would be possible only if the Annex 1, that is the developed countries uh, in the UNFCCC uh, language, the Annex 1 countries, if they reduce their emissions rapidly now, then they allow developing countries more time and more flexibility to do so later. However, if you look at the current NDCs, the enhanced NDCs as they call them, by the developed countries, and these uh, uh, the long-term uh, LTS, the, the long-term targets that they have given, not all of them have submitted official targets uh, of for net zero for 2050. Some of them have them in their local domestic policy document. But what these imply is a backloading of reduction. They're pushing reductions much more into the future. And this is the rich countries that are pushing these emissions reductions into the future. And what this would mean is that the US, EU, this includes the UK, EU plus uh, EU 27 plus UK and China together will emit about 600 gigatons of CO2 at least between 2020 and the next The budget for a 50% probability is 500 uh, gigatons of carbon dioxide. So just these three together, three regions together will emit much more than what is required for 1.5, leaving no space. And so therefore, the pressure is for developed countries to undertake this, to, to, to start reducing now, 
there's pressure on every country to start declaring their zero targets to start reducing now enhance your mitigation production targets so that this trajectory the blue line that we see is achieved by developing country reductions so this space that is available then is uh, is available again for developed countries who have historically emitted much more is available for them to free ride on developing country mitigation so in this context, I, I would uh, like to submit that on the net zero, the entire halabaloo about net zero, this narrative needs to be called out. It is inadequate, if not a false narrative. And therefore, I think that India must not declare a net zero target. Developed countries, in fact, must uh, declare what the cumulative emissions are going to be, if, what the, their targets imply the cumulative, that the cumulative emissions would be. India, that doesn't mean India must not do anything. India must do what it can domestically, but it should not compensate for the free riding by developed countries. This is exactly what is happening now. Pressure for on developing countries to mitigate and the constant pushing forward of mitigation targets by developed countries. Earlier said 2012 for Kyoto, then 2020. Now, none of that wants to be discussed. Uh, you know, we are talking about 2050, so 30 years in 2050. So when we talk about climate ambition, and unfortunately what has happened is a huge number of trackers of uh, you know, in, indices that uh, measure whether adding action is adequate or not, and you have a whole slew of these coming up uh, just before a COP to build up pressure, uh, unfortunately do not measure action on the basis of what is an equitable effort that goes into uh, climate change mitigation. They do so uh, only in terms of, uh, you know, what are the costs and a whole lot of other things, but I won't go into that right now. Uh, so, so what India's uh, position must be is that climate ambition must be measured on the basis of equity. And the question, the challenge domestically for us really is how we can achieve higher levels of development within our fair share of the carbon budget. How can India do this? Unlike developed countries who have overconsumed their fair share, we don't have the same luxury. We cannot consume more than our fair share, but we should not give up the right to our fair share. And so the developmental challenge for us is huge. We have low development, low energy, low emissions. It's a very uh, basic classification, but it doesn't just classify countries based on GDP. This classification is based on, uh, on multiple developmental parameters, equity. Um, uh, you know, infant mortality, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and so this is a classification, three-way classification of high development, medium development, and low development. This is very clear. If you look at per capita energy use, there is a significant difference across these categories. We may not want to go to to, to three thirty-eight, the levels of the US, but there is no doubt because of a lot, all of the developmental indicators are correlated positively with energy. I'm not even talking about emissions. So if we want to increase access to energy services, uh, make sure that we have enough uh, investment in infrastructure to allow for this, then energy, energy use per capita has to increase and increase to some level at least. Perhaps not, we may not need the same levels of energy use in developed countries, but we cannot do it with these levels of energy use. And so therefore, uh, we need to be able to uh, you know, have a position, India's position in response to this entire net zero pressure needs to be based on an understanding of its developmental requirements. It's extremely important now because, as I've said, it's just the three highest emitters are going to consume more than the 1.5 degrees Celsius budget. So we are looking at a world which is greater than 1.5 degrees Celsius. And so we need uh, to ensure that, uh, you know, we have uh, we invest enough in development because that is really our first safeguard against climate change, you know, for adaptation. That is what we need to do, increased resilience of our people to be able to do this. Um, and we should, like I said, we should do what we must, but there is a cost involved in mitigation. To, to, to claim that there is no cost, uh, in my opinion, would uh, be incorrect. There is a cost. The southern states and just the southern states are paying quite significantly, um, you know, every year 
to absorb higher levels of renewable energy today. And so it is, uh, it, it is still costly. I mean, there has been a lot of, uh, you know, reduction in costs globally, but uh, this is uh, currently still leads to a total cost on uh, in the Indian energy system. So India's energy options are also limited. We don't have natural gas. The transition in developed countries has been to natural gas. You know, just today, uh, you, you know, there has been a statement uh, from an uh, African leader saying that this is really what is happening. The pressure to stop fossil fuel use, uh, the 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 moratorium on funding for uh, fossil fuel uh, projects is really going to hurt development in Africa uh, because there is. Uh, uh, you know, if there are no options like the developed countries had of natural gas or nuclear for that matter, what is it that countries in the global south do? And so this becomes really an important question. I think I have uh, overshot my time, so I'll stop here and perhaps then we can have a discussion later. Thank you. Thank you, Teju. Um, now I will hand the podium to Novaroz. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Shobhan. It's very good to be part of this group with uh, Professor Srinivasan and uh, Som, Tejal uh, and yourself. Um, so, uh, Shobhan, you asked me to talk about uh, institutional, uh, uh, institutional issues and climate institutions and so on. But before that, I'm just going to sort of pick up from where Tejal left off and talk about a little bit about uh, what it is that these institutions should really be trying to do, right? So we can't really talk about institutions and policies without uh, beginning with what the objective is. And uh, Tejal's presentation is a good sort of uh, kickoff point for that. Uh, I broadly agree with a lot of what Tejal said in terms of the risks to India of kind of prematurely coming up with a net zero target. I just don't think that uh, we know enough to know whether trying to achieve a net zero target, certainly by 2050, will place the cost of the transition on the back of India's poor. And that's just not tenable. It is true that there are, that mitigation in some aspects is costly, as Tejal said, but it is also true that mitigation brings a lot of co-benefits. Are the co-benefits sufficient that we can deal with India's poverty uh, problem? Nobody knows the answer to that. So jumping ahead in a sense, um, and um, coming up with a net zero target could be risky for India. But the other part of this is to say that India has a strong interest in accelerating global mitigation, but I'm not entirely convinced that net zero targets actually drive that to the extent that they're touted to, partly because they, talk, they, they lead to countries talking about what they will do 30 years from now, in the case of China, 40 years from now. Whereas what we really need is, as they did, was saying, to front load action. So that front loading of action, I think, collectively is what we want. Now, what is it that India needs to do, given, uh, uh, given all of this? Obviously, we need to do mitigation consistent with our development needs. And we need to both act ourselves and encourage the world to focus on near-term actions. And in a country like India that is still growing rapidly, GDP is growing, we're going through a demographic transition, an urbanization transition, we have the possibility of avoiding locking into high carbon infrastructure, high carbon behavioral uh, uh, decisions, and so on, right? So, we, so the more we do upfront, in fact, the, uh, 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 the, 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 the potential exists at least for us to be more competitive uh, in the global economy, because we will be actually uh, um, putting in place technologies and infrastructures uh, that uh, uh, that are now being uh, developed and being and, and where industrialized countries are actually replacing their infrastructures to go down this road. So it's renewable energy technologies, but also public transport systems and and so on and so forth. So we really need to be thinking about how the Indian in economy and society can transition to a low carbon future. But that transition is best thought of not as a single large economy-wide uh, kind of net zero construct, but more as a series of sectoral transitions. How do we decarbonize electricity? How do we make our urbanization process more sustainable? How do we make our freight system uh, 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 more rail rather than road-based, more low carbon? Um, how do we think about 
uh, industrialization in the future and job creation in ways that are at least primed for future technologies that might be low carbon. So we have to think about these sector by sector transitions, right? So now when I come to institutions, it's institutions and legal processes that allows India to bring together our development uh, imperatives with a vision of a low carbon future. Those are the kinds of institutions uh, that we need, right? So what do those look like? So I'm gonna sort of spell it out in two or three ways. One is, I think that it would be extremely useful at this stage for India to have a legal framework that lays the basis for this low carbon transition. And why is a legal framework important? Well, because too often, and the way in which our existing governance structures are set up, we are thinking about climate change as a subset of environmental issues. Uh, so for example, in our, what's called our conduct of business regulations within the government, which ministry takes charge of what? Climate is embedded within environment. But we all know climate change is about urbanization. Uh, uh, it's about adaptation issues, so it takes you to agriculture. It's about decisions uh, about the whole future of this uh, economy. Um, it's, it's about, a, it's, it basically covers, it's an all of economy problem, essentially, right? So we need a legal framework that spells out uh, the fact that we need to be thinking about climate change in a way that internalizes climate considerations. And by that, I mean considerations that bring together climate and development across the board uh, in uh, certainly the central government, but also in interactions between the center and the states. So a legal framework sends that signal. Now, when many people hear the word climate law, they think that must be, you know, some kind of net zero target, some quantitative target, followed by kind of a regulatory structure. But that's not necessarily the case. Many other countries, South Africa, uh, for a while, South Korea with its uh, Green Growth Act, Mexico, other countries had more facilitative legal frameworks that tried to mainstream climate change and induce ministries to think through the co-benefits, the trade-offs, of bringing together mitigation and development. So that's the kind of legal construct we need. And the other thing the law can bring is it can bring, uh, it can put in place institutions whose responsibility it is to analyze and think about these things. Now, India is always a little bit late to the game at these COPs. We're still trying to figure out exactly what our position is if, if, if sort of rumors are to be believed. And in part, it's an institutional story. You can't place the burden of this only on the Ministry of Environment. It's a much bigger, uh, bigger sort of question. So, so we need to have the institutions that allow us to think about, about these things. Um, Shoibal, can you just give me a time check? How much time do I have? Shoibal? No? OK, I'll just keep uh, going. You have another six, seven minutes, I believe. OK, thanks. So. Uh, so, so that's sort of the legal framework, but the legal framework has to then uh, uh, actually embed within it key institutional uh, 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 elements, right? So the kind of elements that we, uh, we've done some issue briefs at CPR, we've, we've uh, just had a webinar actually on climate law. So we've been trying to think about what this, what this looks like. And what we, what, we are, uh, what we are proposing in a sense, and this is, this is something that we, have written about not just for India, but for climate governance more generally, that there are three big climate governance tasks. One is strategy setting, right? So the vision of a low carbon future that brings together development and climate change requires analysis and debate and discussion with stakeholders uh, in those sectors as to what the trajectory forward should be, right? So 10 years ago, uh, India put in place its solar mission. And it was, there was a decision made at the time to focus on utility scale, uh, 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 basically grid connected solar. There were other ideas out there at the time. People said, why don't we do solar hot water heaters, do decentralized solar and so on and so forth. But there wasn't that much thinking paid, for example, to whether or not India's solar trajectory would also be a job creating trajectory. Uh, by comparison, China and to some extent South Africa took very different approaches where they said, we are not going to focus on rapid deployment. We're going to focus on building manufacturing capacity, even if the deployment is a bit slower, 
So that's an example where perhaps we didn't think through the development choices that went into solar promotion. And it's those kinds of questions. How do you bring development and climate together that we need institutions uh, to do? So for example, we've, we've moved to the idea of a low carbon development commission, which, is, which includes experts, but also representatives of labor organizations, media, uh, representatives of coal affected states and so on and so forth to think about those sector by sector transitions in areas like decarbonizing electricity, in urbanization in the transport sector uh, and so on. So the first is kind of a strategy setting role. We need a body to do that. The second is one of the truisms of climate change is that the scale and scope of the transformation is so big that you are going to create losers, right? And so if we want to have a just society as well as a low carbon society, we have to have mechanisms where uh, we think through transition and compensation plans, for example, for coal mining communities, if ultimately coal is to be phased out, or if it's over 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, there will be a phase out of coal, almost certainly. How do we factor in uh, the sorts of compensatory structures as well as new livelihoods for both workers and the communities that depend on them? So there is a deliberative and an engagement process that institutions have to, uh, have to put in place. Uh, South Africa, for example, is a very nice presidential commission on climate change where they bring together affected stakeholders of all sorts and try and kind of hammer out what would happen. In Germany, they have a history of corporatism where labor and government and the private sector sit together and is in a sense kind of bargain uh, it out. So we have to think about how we do this because we also want a fair transition, not just a low carbon one. Uh, the third piece of this is a coordination piece. Because climate change uh, cuts across so many uh, ministries and areas of, 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 uh, uh, of human endeavor. There has to be a coordinating structure at the governmental level, uh, both at the central and the state uh, 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 governments. We have had coordinating committees in the past. We have something at the moment called the Executive Committee on Secretaries, but it is really kind of a high level troubleshooting body. It's not a true coordinating body. So we need something that solves that problem. Uh, and the last piece of this is, we need to have a climate governance system that speaks to Indian federalism. So we need to have a system where states are encouraged to experiment, for example, with climate resilient crops, um, or uh, also states are encouraged to band together, the Himalayan states, the coastal states, to come up with mechanisms uh, for adaptation or to experiment with urbanization uh, approaches and so on and so forth. And the role of the center there really has to be to provide the public goods, both intellectual public goods, as well as financial uh, incentives. So we need to build a structure at the, at the federal level too, uh, uh, for states. So these are the, so, so just to quickly summarize then, institutions for what? Institutions to bring together development and climate change in a way that mainstreams climate change, keeping in mind development objectives and justice, for that, we need an overarching legal framework that sets this out as an objective and creates enabling institutions. Those institutions need to uh, perform roles of strategy setting, building consensus and coordination, as well as enabling uh, climate change to be internalized in India's federal structure. So that's, that's the way forward. It's a lot of ingredients, a lot of moving parts. Uh, but if we're serious about building the underlying uh, institutional um, lattice for long-term climate action, uh, that's what we should be thinking about. Shoibal, back to you. Thank you, Navroz. That was a very lucid talk on what sort of institutions we need going forward. Um, I think I will uh, take over now and latch on to the first few minutes that you spent on, uh, on uh, you know, the kind of sectoral policies that we have had in the past and um, how do we uh, move forward from this? Um, let's see. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. 
So I'm going to uh, limit myself to uh, what has worked in the past and what sort of policies uh, we should continue, uh, at least in the short term, the next 10, 15 years. Um, so by and large, this overlaps a little bit with what Navarro said, what has been India's approach to policy making and whether we can build a slightly more ambitious near-term climate policy based on what has worked so far. Um, so by and large, India's approach, as uh, pointed out, has been uh, one of uh, you know, centralized policy making and often ad hoc and often um, sectoral. So, uh, and I would say that these uh, policies by and large can be divided into three types. Uh, one where you have national targets, policies, um, and so a new mechanisms are introduced to sort of meet those targets and these get some sort of policy support. Uh, this has been seen, for example, in the case of LED bulbs or solar PV. A second set of strategies are about uh, providing fiscal support uh, for certain technologies. Uh, it's often in the form of budgetary support or subsidies. Again, a good example is solar PV and uh, transmission expansion for the sake of uh, renewables. Uh, a third set of strategies have to be ha are about Introducing, introducing new regulations, new standards. Uh, these have worked in the case of uh, appliance ratings, for example, um, efficiency standards for appliances, then vehicular fuel efficiency standards, emission standards, and so on. And these, I would say, have worked fairly well, and we need to build on these, but in a more coherent framework, as, uh, as Navros has pointed out. Um, so let me go sector by sector at, uh, and looking at what has worked and, and how to go beyond that. Uh, the first is of course, electricity sector and coal. Uh, the power sector is responsible for almost half of India's emissions. Um, at the same time, the national solar mission and various, uh, you know, very ambitious targets for renewables expansion in the last decade or so uh, have, I would say dramatically changed uh, at least India's uh, power generating capacity. So right now we are almost at 40% of our generating capacity being non-fossil and it, about a fifth of India's electricity generation is coming from non-fossil sources. Um, and if our expansion plans proceed uh, and are successful, then we are likely to see approximately 50 to 60 percent, 55 to 65 percent of India's uh, electricity generating capacity is non fossil in, by 2030. And the share of clean generation uh, would more than double. Um, so, the reason for this, of course, is uh, primarily the success of, uh, of the dramatic reduction in renewable, in the cost of renewable electricity both as a result of technological change as well as a result of uh, various policy decisions made at home. Um, so uh, this is based on, on a work of uh, on a recent work of mine. If we project um, cost of generation uh, in mid, mid decade in the 2024-25 range, uh, what we find is that cost of uh, renewables plus uh, four, four to eight hours of storage would actually be fairly close to a new fossil fuel plant, uh, a new coal plant actually. So effectively signaling that uh, it doesn't really make much sense to build a new coal plant going forward. And uh, in some sense, we are already seeing that there has been a, 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 a large a significant slowdown in, in new coal capacity coming online in the last few years. The next uh, thing I would look at is carbon taxes. Now, this might be surprising for a significant number of people that India actually has significant carbon taxes, though they are often implicit more than explicit. Uh, our only explicit carbon tax is the clean energy system coal, which is about 400 rupees a ton or approximately three to four 
dollars a ton of uh, carbon dioxide. Uh, but when one tags along uh, transmission subsidies provided to renewables and uh, the fact that uh, rail freight of coal, coal is the biggest source of rail freight, and this actually cross subsidizes passenger traffic, then the implicit carbon tax is often significantly higher. Um, and this already shows, um, I think more than half of India's uh, coal is, has a running cost that is comparable to that of new renewables. Um, the second thing I would point out is uh, fuel tax, tax on diesel and petrol. Um, these actually are fairly high in India. Um, in fact, comparable to tax on transportation fuels in Europe. The tax on petrol or diesel is approximately $200 or $300 per ton of CO2, significantly higher than, say, USA or China. And again, one can see the impact of this uh, in the sales of uh, you know, EVs, especially two and three wheeler EVs. Now, these taxes that I'm referring to, especially the fuel tax, is uh, significantly higher than what most models suggest is required for a decarbonization in the coming decades. Um, what does this mean for the entire economy as a whole? Uh, about 60% of India's emissions were already taxed in 2018, uh, and they have paid a tax of at least four to five dollars a ton. Uh, if you look at transportation fuels, about 11-12% of India's emissions, these were taxed at a significantly higher rate, uh, approximately $200-$300 per ton of fuel. Um, so this uh, sort of underappreciated fact that India's effective carbon taxes actually already uh, operate as a very stiff carbon tax and is already changing the way uh, India uses fossil fuel energy. The next thing I would focus on happen to be our electric vehicle policies. Now, as pointed out, the cost of running uh, two and three wheelers using internal combustion engines is likely significantly higher than electric vehicles. But electric vehicles have uh, a, a higher uh, purchase cost. And so these uh, India's policies are effectively about providing an upfront uh, subsidy to the purchase cost of two wheelers and three wheelers. Uh, and it's significantly on two wheelers and three wheelers, much less so on four wheelers. What we find is that today, uh, three wheelers or the autos that one sees in Indian cities are ec more economical than internal combustion engines, even without a subsidy. And with subsidies, most two wheelers, most electric two wheelers are again, more affordable than internal combustion engines. In fact, if uh, the current trend of decline in uh, lithium in the cost of lithium batteries continue, and uh, with the additional uh, policy framework that's already there, uh, we are likely to see more than a half, more than a quarter to a third of India's uh, new vehicles, new two wheelers uh, will be you know, electric vehicles by 2030. Now there's something simple that could possibly be tried, which is to mandate that uh, all two wheelers by 2030 uh, would be, uh, that will be sold in the Indian market should be electric. And this I believe could, uh, could you know, set the kind of industrial policy and uh, targets that would change the way Indian, the Indian automobile industry as well as the nascent uh, lithium battery manufacturing industry would jumpstart in the country. And uh, one thing to note is that India still has very low vehicular ownership and three fourths of the vehicles in the market on the roads are actually two wheelers. So the success of this policy, as well as the success of the greening of the electricity grid means that by the time Indians are actually rich enough to buy significant number of vehicles and afford to consume electricity at a higher rate, it, the Indian uh, energy system would actually change to the point where the only vehicles that would be available in the Indian market would be electric vehicles. And the 
electricity that will be generated for consumption would also be mostly green. So this is, uh, uh, this is the, in some sense, one could say is, is uh, one of the benefits of, of, be, of, of the catch up effect where by the time Indians are rich enough to consume significantly, the sources of energy and the kind of consumption they would do would be significantly greener than those who uh, developed a few decades ago. Um, and the thing that uh, Novoroz mentioned was uh, transportation and, and freight. Now, the single most source of, single biggest source of transportation emissions in India happens to be diesel trucks. Uh, something like 40% of India's transportation emissions come from trucks. And if, if we manage to move a significant part of this freight back to rail, then we can significantly reduce uh, emissions, cumulative emissions in the next coming decades. Uh, and we are moving in this direction. The entire railway network in India has been electrified, will be electrified in, in a couple of years. And we are building uh, dedicated freight corridors where freight can travel at significantly higher speeds and need not share uh, need not share a rail network with passenger rail. I think in, in a decade or so, uh, India's freight transportation would be significantly greener and would possibly save tens of gigatons of carbon dioxide emissions in the coming years. Um, the other major source of increasing emissions in India happens to be residential electricity consumption. In fact, it is the fastest growing category of electricity consumption in the country. Um, and improving appliance efficiency uh, via regulatory policies happens to be the fastest and the most efficient way of controlling additional emissions that are going to come from this category of emissions, from this category of consumption. In fact, as um, India warms and gets richer, the demand for space cooling in the form of air conditioning and cooling will uh, grow exponentially. Um, in fact, the IEA projects that uh, in a few decades, India's space cooling needs would be comparable to today's uh, entire electricity generation. And so uh, improving efficiency in this category of appliances will make a significant difference to India's energy consumption. In fact, uh, as early as 2027, India's electricity consumption could be lowered by 5 to 10% if we improve the efficiency of our air conditioners. Um, and India has already had a successful program to replace um, incandescent lamps with LEDs and CFLs. And it's estimated that this reduces uh, evening peak demand by something like 10 gigawatts. So what's left? Uh, this is the more difficult part, the industrial sector. Um, cement, steel, fertilizers, and chemicals. Uh, the four big core industries contribute about 80% of India's emissions, industrial emissions. And uh, these are likely to grow by at least a factor of two or three uh, in the next decades. Um, now, at least in some categories, the high cost of energy has already made India's um, industrial sector is very efficient. For example, India's cement sector is among the most efficient in the world. Um, we have had a set of policies called uh, perform, achieve, and trade, which incentivize industries to meet efficiency targets and then uh, let them trade efficiency certificates. And this has led to quite a few improvements in energy efficiency and emissions of different uh, industrial sectors. Now, uh, in the long term, of course, uh, India's uh, industrial energy use challenges remain uh, comparable to the rest of the world. And, and that sort of decarbonization on hard to abate sectors can change only when uh, significant revolutionary change happens. And one of these is, of course, electrification of uh, you know, uh, industrial energy use to the extent possible. A second one, of course, is uh, using hydrogen as a feedstock. And so the newly launched uh, National Hydrogen Mission is, is a step in this direction. And we can possibly expect in a few decades, uh, for example, India's uh, steel industry to move uh, towards uh, use of hydrogen for steel manufacturing instead of carbon. Uh, 
So, as I said, uh, these various sectoral policies uh, have achieved significant success and are likely to actually increase the pace at which uh, emissions and emissions intensity of the Indian GDP uh, reduce in the next uh, decade or so. So what does this mean for India's NDCs and going forward? So I'll focus on, on two of India's three NDCs where we have actually achieved significant progress. The first is 40% uh, uh, non-fossil share of electricity by 2030. In fact, I believe we will achieve it this year or latest by next year. Um, the second NDC that India promised was about uh, 30 to 35% reduction of the emissions intensity of GDP uh, by 2030 compared to a 2005 baseline. But one, admittedly, one could say that, well, maybe the nationally determined contributions were not um, ambitious enough. Uh, but it's uh, heartening to see that in, in both cases, we are likely to significantly exceed uh, our contributions. Our, our NDCs. And uh, I believe that uh, given the pace of progress by 2030, India's uh, non-fossil share of generating capacity could be as high as 55 to 65%. Um, and uh, India's emissions intensity could reduce uh, to 40 to 50% compared to 2005 instead of 33 to 35%. And given what I spoke about, uh, the cost of coal compared to renewables and storage, India could possibly also consider uh, no new coal plants in a decade or so. So these are the kind of ambitious and updated nationally determined contributions that India could uh, possibly consider this year or next year. So uh, I'll conclude by saying that uh, the sectoral and co-benefits led development centric approach, uh, this is a phrase from one of Navroz's papers in fact, um, has been fairly successful and is very likely to continue. Um, and given the progress that we have made, uh, I think India's NDCs could be significantly more ambitious uh, going forward. Navroz has already covered that we, we need a, a coherent climate institutional framework and I believe this is uh, this the software of of policy making is what India would likely focus on uh, in this decade. Uh, besides what India can do on the domestic front, in the international front, uh, the focus on uh, climate finance and equity in um, cumulative emissions uh, budget for uh, India and other developing countries is something that India should. Uh, focus on in the negotiations this year and going forward. Thank you. Well, I will turn over to Som now. Yeah, uh, thank you, Shogal. Uh, let me just... Uh, I have a few slides which I'd like to share with the audience. Um, so uh, basically what I would like to just quickly talk about is about uh, two issues, which is uh, effectiveness and equity in, uh, internet, in an international climate agreement. Um, and the first question is, well, why don't we have an effective climate agreement already? Uh, as we heard from Tejal, uh, the Paris commitments are not going to take us out of the danger zone, uh, that they're not insufficient to do that, that's clear. And in particular, the high emitting uh, developed countries plus China are going to, uh, you know, emit enough that the 1.5 degree target will be um, unattainable. So the question is, uh, you know, why is it that there has been a collective failure um, at the global level? Um, and in my reading, this is essentially due to the domestic politics of most countries. Um, there are three groups that matter in most countries. Um, uh, 
One is activists who want action to reduce the danger from climate change. Uh, two, fossil fuel owners and employees who want to protect their profits or jobs. And three, the general public that does not pay much attention to climate change. Uh, so the role that these three groups played roughly is the activists try to stir up the public and make the public aware of the danger of climate change. Fossil fuel owners try to prevent the public from paying attention to the problem by, uh, you know, uh, you know, intervening in the political process and in the, in the media and so on. Uh, and the public, as I said, uh, so far has in most countries has not paid too much attention. They, you know, most people have lots of things to worry about. Uh, and the effect is that fossil fuel owners have so far successfully prevented the public from getting really worried in most countries, with the result that their governments have taken only baby steps to deal with climate change. Now, I, I think this is going to change in this decade itself, right, in the decade of the 2020s, because as we've already seen accelerating impacts of climate change, and these impacts are becoming more and more obvious. They're not, no longer things that you have to tease out with statistical, sophisticated, uh, you know, sophisticated statistical analysis. The things that are sort of visible to the naked eye and becoming more and more obvious, uh, more and more extreme events, and so on. And the second, uh, you know, trend that is happening is that the value of fossil fuel assets has already started to decline, uh, particularly in coal, uh, but that's also uh, even in true petroleum to some extent already. Right. And then, of course, this is because the market is anticipating, uh, financial markets are anticipating uh, transition. So when the public in, you know, in many countries gets really worried, then their governments will be pushed to take strong action. Right? And that strong action will, of course, include not only domestic actions in each country, but any, uh, an effective international agreement. So I want to say a little bit about effectiveness and equity, right? When governments are ready to take strong action, and I believe this is not very far in the future. I think it's likely to happen to a greater and greater degree in the 2020s itself. Okay, but maybe a little, might take a little longer, although I doubt it. Um, when governments are ready to take strong action, how should an international agreement be structured so that it pro both provides governments with incentives to act and also is equitable. And the, you know, one question that arises naturally is, is our effectiveness and equity in conflict? Is there a trade-off between the two? So for an international climate agreement to be effective, it must provide incentives to all country governments to reduce their emissions quickly, faster than they would do otherwise. And eventually also to reduce the carbon stock in the atmosphere. I think it's pretty clear now that given the trajectory that the world is on now, uh, we're going to, by the time emissions reach zero, or, you know, in a few decades time, uh, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere would have risen to very dangerous levels. And there's going to be a need to pull carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. Uh, so, those are the two things that, of course, would are needed for an uh, agreement to be effective. You know, emissions have to be reduced faster. And uh, when eventually they get to zero, then the stock is going to have to be reduced. So there has to be carbon dioxide removal. And this effectiveness necessitates a future-oriented perspective. And the reason is that we can't change the past, but we do need to motivate actors to change the future so that we have a better future. Now let's turn, that's about effectiveness. Let me turn to notions of equity. And there are of course, different notions of equity, right? It's not a, it's not a unidimensional concept. So one of the relevant notions of equity in the climate context is the polluter pays principle. And that basically just says that those who have caused harm should pay for it rather than shifting the burden to others of cleaning up the uh, cleaning up the pollution. If we apply this in the climate context, 
it implies that countries should be responsible for reducing their own emissions because their own emissions are emissions, uh, additions to the stock and it's the stock that causes the harm of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And countries should pay for reductions to the stock in proportion to their contributions to it. So when we get to the point of pulling carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, who's going to, that's going to be an expensive process. Who's going to pay for that? How should that, how should those costs be shared, right? And equity says, well, if you apply the polluter pays principle, then those costs should be shared in proportion to the contributions to the stock. So that implies there is a potential conflict between equity and effectiveness since contributions to the stock that cause harm have happened in the past, right? We already have a history and in that history, uh, some countries have contributed much more the developed countries that industrialized earliest have contributed much more to the stock than countries that haven't, didn't industrialize early or haven't yet industrialized to a great degree. So there are other notions of equity, right? For example, a, a very important and common notion is based on the idea that those with the greater ability to pay should pay more, right? And that's the principle under, underlying progressive income taxation, which is common uh, everywhere in the world. Okay, so these are two notions I want to, of equity that I want to mention here. So how can we incorporate both effectiveness and equity in an agreement? So my proposal is the following, that countries that have low per capita emissions should unite behind a proposal with two components. First component is a scheme that has been proposed by Raghuram Rajan recently, uh, what he calls a global carbon incentive for emissions. Right? And the second component, um, Shoibal suggested the name GCI plus, you know, to add the second component. I think that carbon dioxide removal when it occurs at scale, should be prepared, should be paid for in proportion to countries' total contributions to the stock. Okay, so two components, one to do with emissions reductions, the second to do with carbon dioxide removal. Okay, first let me talk about the GCI for emission reduction. What is it exactly? What's the proposal? Proposal is that countries above the global average of per capita emissions pay into a global fund an amount that is proportional to the difference between their per capita emissions and the global average per capita emissions. So that's for countries above the global average. And countries below the global average of per capita emissions will receive payments from this fund in proportion to the difference between the global average per capita emissions and their own per capita emissions. Right. So you can see essentially that whether you are a net, whether you're paying into the fund or you're receiving payments to the fund, uh, either way, the governments of those countries have an incentive to reduce emissions because that will reduce, if you're above the average, that will reduce the payments you have to make. And if you're below the average, it will increase the payments that you receive, right? So it provides direct incentives for governments to act if it's implemented. The other thing that uh, is uh, just an arithmetic consequence is that it's a budget balance thing. So the amount that gets paid in by to the fund is the amount, exactly the amount that gets paid out. So let me just give a quick example. For, for example, let's take China. China emits about seven tons of CO2 per person annually compared to a global average of about five tons of CO2 per person, right? That's a per capita global average is five. And if one sets a carbon you know, price or a rate of $10 per ton of CO2, right? Then China would pay about seven minus five, which is two times 10 equals $20 per person into the fund annually. Right? And that amounts to about 0.2% of China's per capita income, which is about $10,000 okay, at current exchange rates. Let's take a, a low per capita emitter like Uganda. Okay, Uganda has per capita emissions of 0.13 tons of CO2 per person and would receive about five minus 0.13, right, which is almost five, right, into 10, which is $48.7 per person annually, okay? Uh, 
or about that amounts to about 6% of Uganda's per capita income of $817 per person. Okay. So for Uganda, this is a substantial incentive. Uh, it's about 6% of uh, per capita income. That would mean that it's about maybe, uh, you know, uh, considerably larger fraction uh, of the government budget, right? If the government budget is about a fifth of per capita income, then this would be something like, uh, you know, uh, you know, close to 30% of the government budget, right? So it would be a very substantial incentive. Uh, so as we can see, uh, because this scheme has the kind of larger, you know, richer countries essentially uh, paying in, for them, the payment is a relatively small fraction of their income. And because it has the relatively poorer countries receiving the payments, for those countries, the payments are a relatively large fraction of their income. Okay. Now, uh, let me talk a little bit more about effectiveness and equity. It's clear that a GCI would provide all governments with incentives to reduce emissions. Right? Notice that a GCI is future oriented. The formula is based on current and future emissions, right? Because those are the things that you take into account, the amount that a government would have to pay this year and the amount it would have to pay next year and so on and so forth. It's not based on past emissions. And it's this feature that provides uh, the incentive for emission reduction. However, it also promotes equity because current emissions are highly, although not perfectly correlated with past contributions to the stock. There is a link to the polluters pay principle, polluter pays principle, although it has to be said that this is not a perfect link. For example, if you take the example of the US and China, uh, with their current per capita incomes and current per capita emissions, the US would end up paying into the fund uh, about the same proportion, you know, not very different proportion of its GDP as China would, right? And in some sense, that's unfair because the US's historical contribution uh, to the carbon stock in the atmosphere and therefore to the damages that are being uh, inflicted on the whole world are larger than China's contribution. So it doesn't line up well, that well with the polluter pace principle, right? There is some correlation with it, but of course it's not a perfect lineup because it's based on current emissions and not on the past stock, right? And, the, and the, this is in a sense, basically the equity efficiency trade-off because to provide incentives, you have to make payments you know, taxes, transfers, contingent on what people uh, and governments are going to do because you want them to change the behavior in the future. But to take equity properly into account, you also you have to take into account not only what governments are going to do, but also what they did in the past, right? Uh, and so that's why the uh, correlation isn't perfect, right? But there is a quite a substantial correlation. Okay. Uh, Second point is that per capita emissions are also highly correlated with per capita incomes in our world, right? If the, the richer people are, the more energy they tend to consume, therefore the more carbon dioxide they tend to emit. And uh, that's a fairly, um, uh, that's a fairly high, uh, uh, fairly high correlation, okay? Okay. So the effect is of such a GCI would be that richer countries whose past emissions have done most of the damage from climate change would be make, making most of the transfers to poorer countries who are suffering more of the damage and have the done the least to contribute to the problem. And so it, there is a good, uh, you know, there's a good measure of equity in, in, in that scheme, okay? Now the question is why would high per capita emission countries join an agreement with the GCI even after their domestic politics had changed enough to impart urgency to uh, solving the climate problem? And the answer is, well, perhaps they wouldn't. If there were an alternative, that would persuade low emission countries to reduce their emissions, right? One such alternative that we can already see developed countries thinking about is trade sanctions. And if large relatively rich emitters got together, that might be a possibility. But, and it would be, of course, deeply unfair, right? Uh, 
It would also be less likely, however, to provide sufficient incentives for low emission countries to reverse emissions growth, right? You know, because the truth of the matter is that sticks don't work very well in these kinds of situations. You really need the carrots because you need, you know, uh, poorer countries to have the capacity and the financial resources to be able to get the job done, right? So it would perhaps be self-defeating on the part of the rich countries uh, to be too hard-nosed about this. And that's a good reason for low emission countries to stand united in proposing a GCI, because if they were to be united, then it would be very difficult for rich countries uh, to, you know, to try and achieve the same result without making, uh, providing financial assistance. Uh, you know, some modifications to the scheme could be negotiated. I don't want to go into that uh, since we're running out of time. The second component of my proposal is to agree to cost sharing and carbon dioxide removal in proportion to the contribution of each country to the carbon stock in the atmosphere. And that's also important both for equity and for effectiveness, right? It's obviously important for equity because it's based on, you know, how much the polluter paid, uh, you know, how much the polluter emitted is proportional to how much they would pay. But it's also important to give every country an additional incentive to avoid adding to the stock of CO2 in the meantime. So if that's written into the agreement today, then looking forward, every country knows that every ton that it emits, you know, in the future is a ton that it is potentially liable to pay uh, to remove, right? So it gives an additional incentive to reduce emissions quickly, right? And the urgency of the problem is so great that that's important, okay? Uh, so this is my last, uh, Last thing I wanted to say, when governments do get serious, when domestic politics in various countries permits, then it will be possible to negotiate an agreement in which all countries agree to take much stronger action, provided that all other countries do the same, right? Conditional agreement rather than the voluntary one we have now. Uh, but in order to get this to work and to get most countries on board, it's really going to help to have some clear and transparent principles, right? That first, give every country a clear incentive to reduce emissions, and second, are seen to be generally fair, right? And so I think it's important that low emission countries should get together now and should prepare for such an agreement by agreeing among themselves on this GCI plus or something similar, right? But that conversation, I think, should get started uh, without delay. I'll stop there. Thank you, Som. And I think uh, we are ready to open for a discussion. Would any of the panelists want to ask any questions? Okay, in that case, I will go ahead and ask uh, so and maybe Tejal can also ask the same question is how does um, how does one manage to you know persuade the developed countries uh, to sign on to something like this given that they have been fairly hesitant to come up with the promised uh, you know hundred billion dollars of climate finance uh, that they had promised in in the 2015 uh, Paris Agreement. Uh, well, um, I think that that's a good question. I mean, um, in, in the current situation, I don't think there's much hope uh, that uh, developed countries uh, and China would, uh, would jump aboard uh, such a thing. Um, because I really don't think that in most countries, politics have reached the stage of urgency yet. But I think that that stage is going to be reached fairly soon in, in, uh, in different countries, of course, at different times. Um, and when that happens, then countries are going to get much more serious about emission reduction domestically. And also they will be looking around to make sure that other countries are doing the same. And uh, so I think that the level of seriousness is one big thing. The second thing is that with this uh, GCI scheme, right, the payments are automatically tied to emission reductions in some sense. I mean, not directly, but they give there's a clear and strong incentive 
uh, as you can see with the Ugandan example, you know, even with fairly a small carbon tax rate, uh, you get a large sum of money uh, in a proportionate sense uh, for countries. So countries will have a strong incentive to build out when they're building out their new infrastructure, they'll have a strong incentive to make it carbon free, right? And so they are, that from the perspective of the developed countries, uh, that is going to be much more attractive for them than you know, just ad hoc uh, grants and loans and all kinds of things which can go into uh, you know, any old thing. So I think that that transparency is uh, the second reason. But I think the most important thing is going to be are the lower income, low emission countries going to present a united front or not? Because if they don't present a united front, then I very much fear that when the developed countries feel the urgency to really get cracking, uh, then they will be highly tempted to use sticks rather than carrots. That of course will be counterproductive uh, and will be a bad outcome for everyone. So I hope that you know the, de the developing countries, especially lower middle income and low income countries, will get uh, their act together and um, and present the United Front. Thank you, so uh, I I'd like to turn over to uh, Professor J. Srinivasan for his comments on uh, on the panel so far. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. So uh, let me just share a screen. If you, I'll say a few things. Let me just. Is my slide uh, visible? Yeah. 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 Uh, first, to uh, supplement what Tejal had uh, said very uh, eloquently. Uh, the whole concept of net zero for each country is a mirage. And one sees that clearly when you look at three uh, countries, Saudi Arabia has pledged 2060 as a target for net zero, but has no plans to reduce export of oil and gas. Same thing true in Norway, considered to be a, a role model by many European countries. Uh, it is climate neutral by 2030, but is issuing oil and gas exploration permits both in North Sea and the Arctic. Okay, so so the contradictions are amazing. And just today, Australia pledged net zero by 2050 with no plans to reduce coal exports. And the global media wants to know when India will announce net zero. To me, India is being uh, uh, honest in admitting we cannot announce net zero at present because. The situation that a country around net zero are not really taking seriously, and they are continuing various actions which will increase CO two. So I think this issue has to be raised in COP twenty six in various ways, so that this net zero mirage is removed. Because this is the way in which many countries are trying to escape their responsibility. Now, this is quite clearly seen in the UNEP. Uh, IPCC report recently shows that already between what is uh, uh, promised under, uh, uh, under uh, the uh, various countries NDCs and what is required is a huge gap. This is what they call the production gap. So unless this is brought down, nature has no meaning. And uh, that's why Tejal talked about the need for front loading. Now, one problem India has had all along is uh, that the global media has always looked upon India as somehow being uh, obstructionist. This happened during Paris also. It will happen in COP26. And uh, this to me is ridiculous because a country, uh, let me just push further and point out why that is so. The Arab countries keep asking India to follow a low carbon path. To me, this is absolutely hypocritical because the per capita emission of India is one of the lowest in the world. It has lowest meat consumption, which contributes a lot to CO2 emission, lowest per capita energy consumption, and lowest per capita carbon emission. So a country like this cannot be asked to do low 
carbon pipe. We're already on low carbon pipe. Our only problem is our population is very high, for which we can hold our uh, ancestors responsible, but not the present generation. Okay. Now, the other point is, in the last 10 years, there have been various uh, diversion tactics, including talking, talking about co-benefits of reducing air pollution and uh, global warming. Uh, this is absolutely uh, uh, irrelevant tactic because if India and China desire to reduce air pollution, which, which they should because they cause a large amount of deaths, then the global warming will go up dramatically. This particular figure shows what would have been the global temperature today if aerosols were not injected uh, during the growth in the last 100 years. It would have been more like 1.7 or 1.8 already. It's because of the sulfate aerosol emitted during burning that we are around 1.2, 1.3. Okay? So if India and China decide for their own good to cut down air pollution, then it will be a serious issue in the near term because the global warming will accelerate. So that cannot be issue. Now, this has been one model, you may not believe it. I'll give you a recent paper which uh, compared four different models. All of them say that if you suddenly reduce the uh, air pollution and reduce aerosol emissions from combustion, the temperature will rise anywhere between 0.5 to 1 degree centigrade. Okay? And the mean of that is around, actually around 1. And uh, so this is a thing which should be now not even talked about. Controlling local air pollution and global warming are two separate issues. They cannot be mixed up. And as a matter of fact, if India and China desire to reduce air pollution, one has to worry about how to take care of the additional warming that will occur. Okay? Now, this kind of division tactic has been going on for a long time. 20 years ago, George Bush, in trying to get out of the Kyoto Protocol, argued that Kyoto had failed because it didn't address two major pollutants, black soot and ozone, okay? which was complete red herring. It was not at all uh, a, a true uh, reason. Now, the other thing has been discussed already by Somnath and as well as Shrevel. The fact is that whatever was agreed in the Paris uh, Agreement by European Union to uh, fund $100 billion per year has not been achieved. Okay, And so we'll have to see whether in COP26 anything new will come up. But without that, I don't see why the country will bother to take part in any attempt to control this CO2 emission. Now, Mamla pointed out how uh, one could change many of these things. And the example is Montreal Protocol. Montreal Protocol is a wonderful example of how if the developed world shows leadership, then we all can do something very similar to uh, Montreal Protocol. They're also, they developed the world in develop, uh, the world in two parts, developed and developing. Developing were given more time to reduce the ozone, ozone depleting substances while they developed reduce it rapidly. So that leadership is lacking today. And ironically, that leadership was provided by a uh, reader, uh, Ronald Reagan, who was not an environmentalist. And he did that because of two reasons. One, he was, uh, in his second term, he was not due for re-election. That was a great advantage. And secondly, he had got skin cancer. And when his uh, advisors pointed out that ozone depletion caused skin cancer, it had a personal uh, uh, reaction he had, he felt something had to be done. Now, that's how uh, some of these reasons are made, and somehow we had to hope that with reason increase in extreme events and disasters, some of the leaders of the developed world uh, will show some leadership in uh, taking the lead in the way they did in Montreal. Okay? And I think the, this quote from the book by Naomi Kellin is very clear. We are stuck here because action that would give us the best chance of averting catastrophe and extreme uh, threatening to elite minority. She was referring to, of course, the fossil fuel lobby. But this could also be mentioned. Uh, we, uh, appear, uh, this also can be uh, told about the developed world. They're enjoying a very high level of uh, standard of living because of use of fossil fuels. 
and they don't want anything to change right now. They think they they can tackle climate change because of their uh, uh, higher wealth that they have. Okay. Now, let, then let me say, it's not an easy problem. This was pointed out more than 40 years ago. This is called a wicked problem because society response uh, everywhere, both developed and developing, are full of avoidance and denial. We don't want to believe that we human beings are uh, uh, affecting the climate of the earth. And there is no change in behavioral response until there's a crisis. And the ethical issue of uh, we taking away the future generation's ability to uh, develop is very difficult to convince uh, most people. So this is the dilemma here, how to convince country, uh, people both in developed world, developing world on a problem which is both uh, long-term and which the serious crisis is just beginning to emerge. And in the case of, uh, of Montreal Protocol, they were able to coin a wonderful word, ozone hole. And that resonated well, uh, both among the leaders and among the public. And uh, everybody wanted to make sure that hole is healed. And we have tried to find a similar wordsmithing to convince both the leaders and the public that we are facing a very serious problem. Okay, I think I'll stop here and uh, thank all the uh, people presented their views very clearly. And uh, I think I would like the audience now to respond, to ask questions. Shoibal, can you take over? Thank you, Jayes, for your comments. Um, Can I say something? Uh, sure, go ahead. Yeah. So I just had a couple of comments, uh, you know, uh, with regards to the question with the GCI. The question is, when is this going to happen? Okay, we're waiting for countries to arrive at a situation where they are willing to take strong action domestically. And uh, developed countries are already using states. It's not as if they aren't. Uh, we you know, through multilateral agencies, development banks, uh, there are in fact uh, much more stringent. Uh, in fact, funding for fossil fuel projects is being stopped everywhere, and the first projects being stopped are in the, the most the poorest countries. So this is already happening, um, and so if we are if we are envisaging something like the GPI, the question is when do we think something like this uh, would kick in? And this is a sort of a variant on the contract and converge, uh, convergence uh, uh, approach that uh, of an earlier era, but with with uh, with, uh, with emissions, um, with the money, with the, with the price attached to those emission productions, of course. But how does it fit in with this with the science as we know today, in terms of what does it mean for the total stock of emissions that this would result in whenever we arrive at a convergence? when those who are paying in and those who get paid, in fact, converge at a point, what would the total emissions be at that point of time? How do we sort of ensure that this trajectory is going to zero is not very clear uh, with, with, with this kind of an approach. And so perhaps um, for some discussion on that uh, is necessary. Uh, so I, I think uh, just one more uh, thing to uh, Shoibal on uh, and even that was uh, really because we are we are talking about uh, enhancing ambition, and what uh, in in what way should India can India perhaps enhance the ambition? One of the things uh, that would, in my opinion, result in is of course we commit to do more today four years from now when you're actually supposed to required to commit more. There's going to be demands for even more, and uh, what this means, however, is that we are promising away the fair share of a carbon budget as a gift to developed countries of free riding on, uh, on the global commons. We are validating their appropriation of the global
So while it is possible for India, perhaps with business and now called stated policy scenarios. So you already have policies that will lead to enhanced more action than we have planned for now. Then we, if we do that without saying, however, that what we free up as space is not going to be available for developed countries. It will be available for us for the future if in case we need it, if things uh, don't go as planned, for example, that is that the costs don't reduce as uh, rapidly as we think or uh, the grid doesn't react as uh, we anticipate to higher amounts of renewable energy. You know, say make in India actually happens, and uh, uh, you know we have much higher growth in industry. What are we going to do in such situations where uh, those trajectories are dynamically different? So, to be able to protect our interests for the future, even as we do what we can do uh, in terms of uh, what is reasonably affordable for us. So I just wanted to flag those two questions. Thank you. Shabal, can I come in? Yeah, go ahead, Nukul. Okay, so, so two things. Um, one on, on the GCI and, and, and so on. I, I, you know, um, my observations, it's a, it's a very uh, sort of, you know, neat idea. It's, it's uh, 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 and some did a great job of kind of laying out um, uh, uh, how it's, uh, 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 you know, incentive, the incentives are all lined up in the way that one would want. Um, my uh, sort of the, my concerns about making that kind of a central plank are really twofold. One is uh, somewhat akin to what Tejal said, is kind of the time and sequencing point, right? Um, I think there's an awful lot that has to happen now which has to be incentivized. Um, and in a sense, we can't really wait for the political conditions to be aligned uh, for that sort of global cooperation to happen. Uh, this decade really is, is quite critical from a climate change point of view. But the second part of it is that increasingly there's literature that basically says, um, uh, look, obviously carbon prices uh, play a role. Uh, and I don't know, uh, I'm sure Sob does, what the estimates are of what the carbon price, I mean, what are we talking about in terms of actually a global carbon price through the GCI? Obviously, it depends on what the contributions are across different countries. But prices are only a part of the story, and you need to have packages of policies that also try and accelerate the decline of fossil fuels. You need to have uh, compensatory policies uh, for social actors, some of these are about finances, others are not. Many of them are about dealing with transaction costs. Arguably the biggest issue in dealing with renewable energy in India is the fate of the discoms. One of the biggest issues with coal is the cross subsidy uh, from railways, the linkage with the public sector banks who are overinvested in coal plants. None of these things are really going to be untangled uh, by a price signal uh, alone. So I think, I think we have to be cautious. So this can be a piece a part of the solution that's worth keeping on the table, but I don't think we should be approaching. I think that I think the silver bullet overtones to the conversation are what worry me. It's 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 complicated, not just politically, but also in terms of transition transition dynamics. So so uh, uh, so I think we shouldn't we shouldn't try and reduce this in ways that that uh, actually might be unhelpful, uh, and certainly keep it sort of part of the conversation. The second, uh, the, the, so that's on the on, on the on the GCI. On on Tejal's point, you know, I think look, the world, the wh where the conversation I think has shifted on all the fair share stuff is that maybe ten years ago, uh, certainly ten years ago, maybe five years ago, you could say that there was, if not a one to one correlation, a very strong correlation between the necessity of increased energy needs and making sure we had access to, to uh, the ability to emit carbon as a way of meeting those energy needs. Now that linkage is much weaker with renewable energy prices. It's also the case that, and it's not my case certainly, that co-benefits are always are ubiquitous, but they are highly prevalent in many cases. Um, and I also think that even with the air pollution story, 
of, uh, Professor Srinivasan is, of course, right about the aerosol story, but if you reduce it at source, then they are uh, uh, mutually uh, reinforcing. So the co-benefit story is not a simple story, uh, but it is a story that allows a lot of action to happen domestically. So in that context, I think the way Tejal put it later on in her question is the way I would agree with it, is that we need to actually think about carbon as a hedge. It may be necessary, it may not be that necessary, we don't know. So we shouldn't be put into a situation where if we need to burn the carbon, we don't have access to it. I completely agree with that. But I'm not sure that that translates to arguments for a fair share. Uh, because a fair share basically says, here's a calculation we're making based on some somewhat abstract determination of how you slice up the pie. And of the uh, uh, authors on this call, uh, at least three of us have been a part of papers that try and slice up that pie in very different ways, just on this call, right? Uh, Schäuble has one, Tejal has one, and I have a late comer to this party, piggybacking on some people who are much more technically skilled than I am. Uh, and so I'm sure you have a version of this too, actually. Um, uh, so, so that fair share story, we're not going to get agreement on it. Uh, so we need, so, the, so I, I think the way to think about it is how do we make sure we have this as an insurance policy while not building a negotiating strategy around trying to nail down right to a resource that we may not use, and that frankly, if we do use all of it in 20 or 30 years, we will be a technologically backward country. Because if we are using all the carbon that Tejal thinks we have a fair share to in 2040, the world will have moved on technologically. Uh, so, I, I, so, so I think we need a more nuanced view, which doesn't mean you throw equity out of the window at all, but we need a more nuanced view on how we engage equity in this conversation. Uh, you know, can I just, so, uh, yeah. yeah, maybe can I just uh, just respond very quickly? So I think you misunderstood what I was saying about a carbon price. So th there is no implication here that countries would have carbon prices internally. They can have whatever kinds of policies they want. Those may or may not include carbon prices. It's just a way of incentivizing all countries, governments, country governments, not firms and individuals and, and farmers and so on but country governments uh, to enact policies which would uh, reduce emissions, right? And to do it in a way which is, you know, more equitable rather than less equitable. So that's point one. But I think the larger point I want to make is that, that I think that the conversation, particularly in India about climate uh, agreements is very unfortunately too India centric. I think that India is going to make no headway and is going to be completely outmaneuvered in international climate negotiations unless it has a large set of allies. But in order to get a large set of allies, you have to have some kind of organizing principle which will appeal to a large set of allies, right? If all your arguments are kind of very ad hoc in nature, right, then they are, you're just not going to get them. Secondly, they have to be not only appeal to an organizing principle, which will get a lot of allies, but all at the end of the day, right, people have to believe that this is going to ultimately end, result in an agreement. It's not just going to be, you know, a position that goes nowhere. So we have to have both components. We need an organizing principle around to build an alliance, a large alliance. Otherwise we're going to, you know, we are not in a strong position. Let's be clear about that. Uh, we're in a very weak position because we're very vulnerable and we really can't do much about it on our own. We need the big emitters to act. Right? So we need those allies because otherwise things are not going to go our way. The second thing is that not only do we need allies, but the principle around which we get those allies has to be constructive enough that it ultimately gets the large emitters uh, to at least come halfway towards our position. So I think that's really the critical thing. It's not so much the details of the incentives or so on. I think it's a good idea, uh, but you know one can argue about that. But I think the larger thing is really one needs organizing principles that appeal to a broad group 
Ratna, which is has uh, has the cost of uh, has the carbon tax on petrol and diesel, or just the high cost of petrol and diesel deterred its consumption? Um, and do we know that? Well, actually, that's difficult to say. I think the point I was trying to make was that the high cost of petrol and diesel makes uh, EVs, especially two-wheeler and three-wheeler EVs, uh, much more attractive. So, and I think it advances uh, their intake by quite a few years. Uh, I think, uh, and that's I believe is is the uh, sort of incidental impact of of the high cost of uh, petrol and diesel. And I think this also, uh, in some sense, uh, uh, partly answers uh, the question that uh, Tejal had, uh, which is, uh, should India make more commitments? Well, it, it just boils down to this. If renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuel energy, then uh, we will definitely, just from the economical point of view, use more renewable energy. And that is, in some sense, what India is doing right now. Um, and so, uh, well, yes. They... Can, can I come in on the costs? Because that this has been said uh, quite a few times. That renewable energy is cheaper than fossil fuel energy. And if you're talking about gas energy, uh, coal, of course, uh, let's not get into uh, the unaccounted for costs of coal, but just the physical production cost also, you're claiming that it's cheaper. But this estimate does not include balancing costs, it does not include grid integration costs, which are equivalent to variable costs of some coal plants. As a, as, you know, the estimates of 2020 they say that they are equivalent. And what about storage costs? And, and how much do we expect uh, these to come uh, down over a period of time? This is in no way to say that, uh, you know, that costs of renewable energy are not reduced. And so therefore, it, it, you, we, we have reason to be much more optimistic about what renewable energy can do and the role that it can play in the future than we had 10 years ago and 15 years ago. There's no doubt about that. And then there is no, no doubt that this is going to play a larger role proportionately as we go along. The point is, how much larger, how soon, at what end? And this goes back to what uh, Navroz had uh, flagged in, in, in his presentation about this balance between uh, R&D, research and development uh, and manufacturing versus deployment and uh, uh, being sure, making sure because you know, while I said that we are gifting our fair share to the developed countries, we will be gifting more than just the fair share of the carbon state. We, we are heavily import dependent for a lot of renewable energy technologies. So this also uh, is an added dimension that we must think about. So at what, at what rate do we advance those targets? You can say that the argument for fair share, uh, when you know, 10 years back, 15 years back, when we were talking about it, we were talking about it as, a, as an architecture for a climate agreement, which included some consensus on fair shares across countries. Here we are talking about staking a claim, which uh, you know, uh, South Africa has done already in its first MEC. It is uh, not the same, India doing it, because it's a big, much bigger number when you take a claim to your fair share. But there, it can be accompanied by various uh, various conditionality. You're not forcing anyone else to accept their fair share. But you have, how do you how do you hedge or how do you preserve your right to that carbon space unless you take a claim? And if a country the size of India with, with our emissions does it, I believe that it is likely to be a game changer, at least sort of a spoke in the wheel of the net zero narrative, where the, the conversation moves back to the science where it really actually should be. Yeah, so I mean, you know, sorry to move, to move here from the costs again, but uh, perhaps a little more discussion on what we mean, what are the comparative costs between which coal and which renewable energy at what year? With storage, without storage, with balancing, without balancing, perhaps is uh, you know would 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 add some value to the discussion. Um, I think the analysis that we did uh, did account for all of these, and 
And despite that, it did come out that by the end of this decade, uh, it would be quite close. Yeah. Uh, Shwabil, can I add something? Sure. One thing about India, people are not discussed is that wind energy in India is actually very poor. We have managed to have a large ins install capacity, but wind is there only for four months a year during monsoon. That's the time it is not there. This is not true of China, Europe, and America. They live in a different latitude. They have a huge advantage. And United Kingdom uh, has gone completely to wind because they have wind throughout the year. So India has a very serious problem is that our wind energy exploitation can only be during monsoon. And we have to depend mostly on solar and solar is not there at night. Now, the demand for power does not go to zero at night uh, mm -hmm. because of industries. So that issue uh, has to be tackled in a very big way because uh, imagine in a non-monsoon month during night when industries have to work, what kind of storage capacity do we need? It's a huge one, right? And have you yeah. looked at that? What kind of capacity you need between uh, 8 p.m. and 6 a.m. Uh, when the wind is not contributing much? Uh, except a little bit of hydro, I suppose. So this is, India has a unique problem which should be highlighted. Uh, we are different from China and different from all the countries in mid attitudes. That's true. India will likely have the highest demand for storage if we turn towards renewables. Yeah. Well, uh, I think we have uh, far exceeded our time budget here. Um, I uh, would any of the panelists want to say something more? Um, any finishing remarks? Professor Jays? No, I think I have said enough. Thank you all very much for this uh, wonderful conversation. And I hope uh, we can extract some, some highlights on and, and some understanding on what India should do going forward. Um, it's a very tricky problem. It's a very wicked problem, as Jay said. And uh, I hope uh, this conversation helps us out. Thank you very much. Okay, I thank all the panelists for uh, doing a good presentation. Thank you, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Good, Good night. night. Good night. Bye-bye.